Good evening. My name is Ian Rees and I'm speaking to you from Tenby in West Wales. It is a crisp day today, crisp evening, and we pray the Lord will bless us as we look at his word together. I would like to uh, read from Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, and this is what we read. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, before we look at the passage and open in prayer, let me just bring two, read to you two verses of a hymn. We'll sing of the shepherd that died, that died for the sake of the flock. His love to the utmost was tried, yet firmly endured as a rock. When blood from a victim must flow, this shepherd by pity was led to stand between us and the foe and willingly die in our stead. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together and let us pray. Our God and Father, we give thanks again for an opportunity this evening to turn to the scriptures, to read the word of God written, and to ask that the Spirit of God might come upon us and into us this evening and help us not only to understand what is being taught in the scripture, not only to be informed in our minds, but also to be touched in our hearts by that one who loved us and gave himself for us. And may our hearts respond in giving ourselves to him in return, we pray. For we ask this in the Saviour's name and for his sake. Amen. I suppose the question that we ought to ask ourselves is this. Why did Christ have to die? After all, some people would teach that all roads lead to heaven and it doesn't matter how you get there. Uh, God would never send anyone to hell and therefore all religions and all ways of life eventually lead to the pearly gates and we have no reason uh, to doubt that. God is love, we are told, and he would never send anyone to hell. But we have to remember that God reveals himself in his word and he is different to what we think he is. Although God is love, he is also just and he is also righteous and he is also perfect and he cannot overlook sin. He cannot disregard it. He cannot just say, oh, well, never mind, I'll let you in because I happen to love everybody. He has a love for the whole of mankind, but he also needs to judge the sin of mankind. And that is why Jesus Christ came into this world. You might remember earlier on, we thought Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, Paul is writing this time not to Timothy, but to Titus. And he gives us three reasons why Jesus Christ died, and I want to bring them to you this evening. Number one, Jesus Christ gave himself for us. Now, I don't know you, and you don't know me, but I can guarantee this, that if Jesus Christ gave himself for us, he got no bargain. <laughs> he got no bargain when he got me, and he'll get no bargain when he gets you either, because this is heaven's best, giving himself for, we could say, earth's worst. And yet the wonderful thing about the Christian gospel is this, that God thought it something worth doing, and Christ thought it something worth doing, that he, the Son of God, might give himself for us. But why? Reason number one, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Now, to redeem is to buy back. It is to set free, in many ways, is to buy back. Slaves were redeemed. An Israelite who fell into debt probably had to serve for many years until his debt was paid, or somebody could come along and pay the price and set him free, set him, redeem him. Uh, there are all sorts of things that we can redeem, that we can buy back. It used to be many years ago that if you fell on hard times, you would take an item along to a shop and you would be given a fraction of its value. And uh, later on, if you had the money, you could go along and buy it back. These shops were 
recognized by the three balls hanging over the doors. They were pawn shops, P-A-W-N, and we still have them today, though they're not called that, and they don't have the uh, three balls hanging over the door, but you can still go and sell something and later on go and buy it back. The scripture tells us that we were sold in slavery to sin and to Satan. We were strangers to God and to his word and to his grace. But Jesus Christ came into the world to save, not only sinners, but to redeem us from all iniquity, to buy us back, to pay the purchase price that was necessary to set us free from slavery to sin and to Satan and those habits that do not please God. He came to redeem from all iniquity. And each one of us, until we are children of God, are children of sin and Satan and servants of sin and Satan and in bondage to sin and Satan. But Christ came to redeem us. And what was the purchase price? It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats as it used to be in the Old Testament. It was the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, that was shed at Calvary. Reason number one. Reason number two. He came to purify unto himself a peculiar people. To purify unto himself, to consecrate to himself, to set apart for himself a people. A people that were ransomed and healed and restored and forgiven. A people who had once not been in fellowship with him, but suddenly knew what fellowship with him was. A people who were set apart for him. Now in Old Testament times, anything could be set apart. A people was set apart for him. That was supposed to be the Jewish nation, but they failed him. But serving in the tabernacle, there was a, a tribe of Levites and priests, and they were set apart for his service, a holy service. But not just a nation and not just a number of tribes, but also things in the tabernacle and in the temple. There were basins, there were spoons, there were forks, there were cups involved in the service of God, in the worship of God. And these were holy vessels. They were set apart for the service of God. They were to be kept only for him and for his purpose. And I believe that's one of the reasons why the fingers of God appeared on the walls of a palace of a pagan king who had decided to take these holy vessels that had been captured and taken into captivity from the temple in Jerusalem and used them in a pagan feast. And God was angry. These were his vessels. I might remember that in Belteshazzar's palace, a hand appeared on the wall, weighed in the balances and found wanting. You cannot profane the holy things. They were set apart for God's service. And Jesus Christ came into the world to purify unto himself a peculiar people. Set people apart for him. In our tradition, we often name our halls, our gospel halls, after the street in which we live. Sorry, where we worship. There's an assembly not far from me that decided not to call itself after the street. The Gospel Hall is in Odd Fellows Street, and they decided not to call themselves Odd Fellows Hall for very good reasons, I would have thought. The world looks at us perhaps as Odd Fellows, peculiar people, but that's not the meaning of the word here. The meaning of the word peculiar is a people for his own possession, a people set apart for him. So that these people who have redeemed, been redeemed, set free, are also set apart. They don't live for themselves. They don't live for the world. They live for God. They should be holy people. 
Be ye holy, says the Lord, as I am holy. A people set apart for him. And such people should live to the glory of God and not for themselves. But then the third reason I would suggest given in this verse is this, that they are a people set apart for him, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And the idea behind the word zealous is set on fire, keen, committed, devoted to his service, zealous of good works. Now in the Bible, we are never ever told that good works are the basis of our salvation. By faith are ye saved, by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when we are saved, our good works are not the root of our salvation. They cannot be. The root of our salvation is the grace of God and the mercy of God and the kindness of God. But although good works are not the root of our salvation, they should be the fruit of our salvation. And as believers, as Christians, we should be zealous to do good works, to show our salvation. Martin Luther, who recovered by the inspiration and the help of the Spirit of God, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, did not like the book of James. Because the Roman Catholic Church came back to him and said, oh yes, you say that we are justified by faith alone. Why then does James talk about works? And Martin Luther called the book of James a right straw epistle and didn't even think it was inspired by the Spirit of God. But of course it is. What James is telling us is this, if you say that you are justified by your faith, show me by your works. So Christians are people that are set free and set apart and set on fire to do good works. First of all, to the household of faith. It's a terrible thing if we can't be kind to each other and good to each other as brothers and sisters but also to unbelievers. People sin because it's their nature. People sin because they know no better. People sin because the world tells them it's acceptable. The Bible, of course, tells us it's not acceptable, but it's the work of the Spirit of God to convict us of sin and show us that we are wrong. And until then, we can expect unbelievers to sin but we should still show them kindness and goodness. We should be winsome to those who do not know the Lord Jesus, to win them for Christ. And once they have been won for Christ, they will see that they have sinned against him and they will turn from their ways and repentance and faith and become zealous of good works. So here are three simple reasons straightforward reasons why Jesus Christ gave himself for us. First of all, to redeem us from all iniquity, to set us free from bondage to sin and Satan. Secondly, to purify unto himself a peculiar people, to set us apart for him, to be for his glory and to live for him alone. And thirdly, to set us on fire to be zealous of good works, winning people for the Lord, not just by our preaching, but by our living. What is to be set free? That is salvation. To be set apart is consecration. And to be set on fire is service. And all these things the Lord Jesus came to do by his death for us, by giving himself for us. Let me just ask you this evening, number one, have you been set free from sin and Satan? Only Christ can do that. It is by faith in him that you will be liberated, made one of his children, indwelt by the Spirit of God, 
and set free at last? Have you been set apart for him? Living for him and for him alone, not for yourself, not for friends or family or the world round about you or your neighbors or your boss or whatever it is, set apart for him. That again is a work of the Holy Spirit. When he comes into our lives, he sets us apart to be his own possession. And last of all, how you zealous of good works have you been set on fire to serve and to love the one who gave himself for you? Three simple questions. I leave it with you. Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, set us free, save us, that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people, set us apart, sanctify us, a people zealous of good works, set on fire to serve him. A little verse from a hymn as I close. And oh, that he fulfilled may see the travail of his soul in me, and with his work contented be, as I with my dear Saviour. May God bless his word to us this evening. Shall we pray? Again, our God and Father, we have opened thy word. We have read it. We pray that it might touch us, that the Spirit of God might give us receptive hearts to realize that our good works will never save us but our good works must show that we have been saved. May each one of us who have listened to this message this evening know what it is to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, who gave himself for us, that these three things might be fulfilled in our lives, and that by the grace of God we might become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Bless us, we pray then this evening, for we ask it, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. And may God bless you.